maybe can you just give me the Coles notes, guys, on, on your companies and what they do, just so we have some added context as to why you are experts on the topic of security token offerings. Canadian Securities Exchange uh, was uh, founded back in uh, 2003 and uh, was intended uh, and is uh, carrying out its mission to provide the lowest cost of public capital for entrepreneurs in Canada. We're particularly well known for our leadership in the cannabis space over the last uh, several years. We have uh, listed uh, uh, a number of companies from Canada and increasingly now from uh, international centers like the United States, South America and uh, Europe. And uh, we're looking for, we're always looking for ways of removing friction from the uh, trading process, from the capital raising process, and to provide new and interesting products to the investing public. And uh, we're very excited about the potential of uh, blockchain technology to solve a number of the issues, and I, I, I concede out, out of the gate, deeply unsexy issues uh, dealing with securities processing in the, in, the, in the back office, what we call. Morning, Don. And uh, we, uh, uh, in doing so, want to do two things. Reduce the costs for the dealers uh, in their processing of trades and providing service to their clients in turn. And uh, more importantly, give new tools for entrepreneurs to raise capital uh, to support their growing businesses. Awesome, Jay. So Blockstation is an end-to-end -end solution for the listing, trading, clearing and settlement of dig digital, digital assets, including launching STOs. So we work with stock exchanges all over the world. Uh, most recently, we've signed a master agreement with the Jamaica Stock Exchange, and very soon they will actually be allowing people to uh, trade Bitcoin and Ethereum across the world, as well as to launch their own security token offerings. Awesome, and I'm just gonna reiterate today, we're talking about how security tokens, how industry will deliver this necessary evolution in equity capital markets. Remember that word, guys, evolution. Uh, the format of today's session, it's sort of like a little talk show, okay? I'm the host, we got our, our guests here. Uh, it's gonna be casual, it's gonna be very informative, uh, informative but informal, as much as you can be here. And uh, I'm gonna keep it, uh, keep it light and, and breezy, so you guys have uh, not just information in your head, but you're also entertained on the way out. Um, We're also going to have a little bit of fun if you guys are all right with that. You guys cool with having a little bit of fun? <laughs> all right, there cool. We go. Yep. <laughs> um, th this slide is uh, basically, we're just, I think Richard kind of established it already, but, you know, blockchain, I think if you're at this conference, you believe in blockchain, you believe in the power of this technology as a platform, you are probably trying to figure out in your own business or in your own life how it's actually going to, from a practical standpoint, make your life better or make your business more profitable um, or run some more simpler. But, but for us, you know, we're going to explore some of the more specific reasons that this uh, technology is, is harnessing, potentially going to harness a lot of change and evolution in uh, equity capital markets. And this message that we're putting across is for you if you're a private company, if you're a public company, if you're somewhere in between, um, it, this messaging is for you. So we want to make sure that if especially you're an issuer or a company that is maybe even a, a blue chip company like FedEx or a startup, this message also applies to you if you're on either side of that spectrum. But today we're talking about how we solve real problems with security token offerings. So just in terms of the blockchain, just by show of hands, how many of you guys believe you have a very strong understanding of the blockchain? Oh, that's, that's great. And how, how many of you guys may be uh, medium, moderate understanding? Okay. And how many of you believe it's low? You don't know very much at all. No one's going right. to admit that, but oh. sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right, great. So what I want to do is I want to bring the medium guys up to speed. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to do something that probably nobody else is going to ask you to do. You guys, to really get this, you're going to have to take off your headphones a little bit so you can hear everybody else or maybe have one of the headphones on. Okay. All right. So uh, Richard, you got a hundred bucks? Oh man, <laughs> I got I got fifty euros though. Oh yeah, okay. no, that'll, that'll work. Fifty euros is good. <laughs> yep, that's almost a hundred bucks. So what you guys are gonna do today is you guys are all gonna be become miners on the blockchain, okay? Fifty euros, and I always take the the money from somebody else because sometimes I don't get it back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this time you're gonna get it back, Jake. <laughs> so so what's gonna happen is. What miners do on the blockchain is they keep track of the ledger, they keep track of the blockchain. And so what you guys are gonna do is you're gonna record everything that happens. So I'm Jay, and the first thing that you're gonna record in your head, or on your iPhone or whatever, you're gonna record that Jay minted this 50 euros, okay? 
Everybody say, can everybody say Jay minted it? All right. And before I spend this money, what we're going to do is we're going to have to confirm what happened before. So I see somebody here really wants to participate. What's the pardon? What are we going to use as the block award? Uh, I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> okay, so can I get your name, sir? Okay, Phil. Phil, I'm going to spend this money with Phil, okay? But before I do that, everybody's going to confirm where did this, what happened before this? Jay? Jay minted it. Jay, Jay minted, minted the it. money, folks. Perfect. So I'm giving it to Phil. Phil, go ahead and spend that money. Please <laughs> give it to somebody else. And what's your name? Sean. Okay, Sean. All right, so before we can transfer that to Sean, we have to go back in the blockchain and confirm what happened before. So Phil got it from? And Jay? Perfect. All right. So again, what was your name again? Sean. Sean. Okay, everybody got that recorded. So Sean, please pick somebody and spend that money. <laughs> uh, he's taking his minor fees. That actually happens on the blockchain. That's the incentive oh, no, mechanism. It's gone now for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So before this transaction can be confirmed, okay, we have to confirm where it came from before that. So who do we have here? Sean got it from? And Phil got it from? Jay. And Jay? Perfect. Okay. What's your name, sir? Fred. Fred. All right, so Fred, you're going to do one last thing, okay? So we're going to have somebody try to counterfeit this 50 euros, okay? <laughs> this guy really And wants I'm going to try to give it to, what's your name? Alex. Okay, so when I give that to Alex, this counterfeit bill, you guys are going to go back in the blockchain. Alex got it from? Fred. You see? Some people saying Jay, some people saying Fred. We don't have consensus. And this is the power of the blockchain. Because when somebody tries to counterfeit it, and even if you have a few miners that are going to say, yeah, you know, this is coming from Jay, you're going to have the rest of the miners, millions across the world, who are going to say, no, this was Fred's money, and therefore you cannot spend it. So you have the transparency. Because of the, all the, the nodes or all the people involved, you have security, and it makes this very powerful and this is why issuers love this. Awesome. Can we give Jay a hand on that example? That was cool. Okay, that was fun. I told you we'd have fun, right? Um, so sort of a follow-on point because now we've established what the blockchain is, how it works, uh, some of the key features of it. Um, we're now going to talk a little bit about one of the instruments or concepts built on the blockchain which was uh, the ICO. Okay, so the initial coin offering. If you don't know the story of the ICO, you kind of don't really know the full story of why STOs exist, okay? And, um, you know, I, I don't know, are we going to jump into the next example right away about what the difference is between STOs and ICOs? Well, uh, yeah, sh sure. I can, I can tell you, for instance, <laughs> you know, if you want to do an STO, which you'll be able to do soon on the CSE or the Jamaica Stock Exchange, you would have to have adequate disclosure, okay? You have to have proper disclosure, just like a prospectus filing. And is that, is that enough information, you think? It's a lot. All right. Uh, on the other hand, with the ICO, what we've seen in the past is a little bit of disclosure. This is the kind of disclosure you might get, OK? On the ICO side, um, you're not going to be able to trade on a registered stock exchange, OK? But with the STO, you're going to be able to? List on a regulated stock exchange. Right. and. That's going to be coming very soon, okay? And well, at the end of the day, one of the main things, I guess, um, if you look at the characters involved, That's right. you can put this on. Nope. If you look at the characters involved, when you're dealing with the stock exchange, you have credible people like Richard Carlton, good looking <laughs> and all that good stuff, who you can trust, and you're working with regulated institutions, etc. And on the ICO side, you've got some characters, you're not sure exactly who they are. So just from a show of hands, would you guys, rather, or just shout it out, would you guys rather do a STO or an ICO? STO, STO. <laughs> STO. <laughs> All right. 
Sorry, that was the best prop we could find for uh, <laughs> being a villain. Usually we use a burglar mask, and I look like the hamburglar. Um, I guess uh, it's just important to uh, 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 just reiterate that the ICO, it's been the common term. It's been popularized over the last few years. Billions of dollars raised on initial coin offerings. If you look at what's being raised in that space now, it's uh, diminished greatly. It's uh, it's falling off a cliff. It's because it doesn't work, okay? For a lot of the reasons we just mentioned, there's no trust protocol built into ICOs. It does not work for capital markets. So with that in mind, we'll move into the next phase of our presentation. Oops. Um, which are, okay, you know, we've identified some issues, but there's really 10 key problem areas in today's capital markets that we feel like we can at least address with security tokens, okay? So security tokens are, are only relevant if they solve real life problems, okay? So we've got a little list here. We're actually gonna go through them individually. This is sort of when we get into the talk show portion of the, uh, of the event, but you know, just to input it into your head just for now, asset Ill illiquidity, corporate transparency, shareholder communications, dividend distributions, Trading shenanigans, that's the best way I could come up with the trading issues that we have today. Uh, the paper problem, which I promise you, if you stick around and tell our presentation the paper problem, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, regulatory overhang, dealer burden, which Richard uh, alluded to, KYC and risk, which we'll, we'll try to make interesting, and shifting demographics. So we actually end with a bang. It's gonna be an interesting conversation. Um, and then take note, again, if you are an issuer, if you're someone who is offering equity for capital, think about and orient your mindset around what SEOs potentially can do for your business because they're coming and they're coming soon. So gentlemen, if you want to have a seat or you can stand, I don't care, but we're gonna start talking about the problems, okay? So problem number one, the investing public. So many of you here, everyone here is the investing public, by the way, you all have the ability to put money at work through investment. The investing public, all of you, are being deprived of lucrative investment opportunities. You may not know that, but you actually are. And uh, maybe Richard, you can outline what, what's happening today and then we'll talk about what's gonna happen tomorrow with STOs and how that's gonna be uh, uh, fixed. I can tell that everybody is uh, really excited to hear a dissertation on the history of clearing and settlement in the securities industry. Yes. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> the present system that we have in place was actually born in the mid 1970s. It was in response to an in what at the time was regarded as an incredible explosion of trading. They probably traded 15, 20,000 trades on the Toronto oh, Stock wow. Exchange in a single day. Incredible. It was so difficult for the industry to keep up with the paper that they actually instituted a new system where they closed the exchange on Wednesday at noon, and then everybody went back to the office and started moving the paper back and forth, and they kept the exchange open on Saturday morning until 1 p.m., leaving Saturday afternoon and Sunday to catch up from the previous week. Everybody agreed that that was not a supportable situation. And with new computer technologies, big IBM mainframes and databases that uh, took hours to populate a few cells, this was a technical revolution that was going to cut costs and support incredible increases in trading activity. Now, there are a lot of problems with, with where they went, but it was pretty darn good for 1978. We're 41 years later and we're using the same technology which has huge limitations on every, and impacts every aspect of the capital raising process. Mm -hmm. So the first uh, example we're talking about here is the cost that it takes to get a security into the markets. And the impact that that has on the issuers and the dealers and everybody else involved in the, in the food chain. So what we've seen over the last several years are really, really interesting investment products which are solely reserved to rich people and institutions through private equity. So we were thinking of some examples yesterday. The 407, a perfect, infrastructure asset, it's generating revenue, substantial income for the people who own it, which I think at the time, it now is a SNC Lavalin and a Spanish construction company. You all I know think. what the, uh, the 407 highway is? Private highway? Privately held highway? You all use Okay, just making sure. If the Ontario government had been able to securitize that asset using a tokenized security 
and floated that asset on the public markets, I can guarantee you they would have gotten a significantly higher price. And I would feel a heck of a lot better driving on the 407 knowing that some of that revenue was actually coming back into my pocket. And mine too. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're looking at now is a situation we're not growing that many new public companies, especially in the large cap space, uh, except for the cannabis industry. Um, and public investors are seeing fewer and fewer different opportunities to participate in the markets. And we think by tokenizing a whole variety of assets that have wound up in the private equity market, we can actually bring really interesting, high quality products back to the public investor. Yep. One of the other things, the, the power of the blockchain, although ICOs had their share of problems, one thing that it showed us was the efficiency of the blockchain in terms of transferring value. So for example, if I want to participate in an offering in France and I want to send $100 Canadian, it might cost me $100 in wire fees, which is doubling the cost of my investment. Whereas if I were sending uh, a digital asset like a Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever there may be, that might cost me 50 cents to send that $100 and suddenly that makes it more inclusive to allow different people to invest in the opportunities. Right, so this idea of fractional ownership of an asset where you can actually take a company like Barrick Gold and say you believe strongly about their gold producing assets and actually participate in a royalty stream that is singularly focused on that and not worried about all the other stuff in the overhang of their business as a corporation and their other operations globally. That's, that's just one example I can think of. Oh, about. I'm, I'm really excited by companies that have portfolios of intellectual property. Uh, everybody knows that Michael Jackson at one point purchased the Beatles back catalog. And he was the beneficiary of all of the revenues that that catalog was generating from radio airplay for licensing uh, in connection with commercials and other things. That deal couldn't possibly be done in the public uh, sphere using the existing structures that we have to clear and settle and manage the revenues that uh, an asset like that would generate. Using the blockchain and a security, a security token, we can actually do that. And so gives, uh, again, owners of intellectual property a way of monetizing that asset. Think about how much happier Paul McCartney and how much richer he could be if he actually owned all those rights still through blockchain. Okay, we'll move on to problem number two. Investors actually don't know if their votes matter or how their capital is being used. So believe it or not, you people all have a lot of trust in the companies that you invest in. You just, you know, either buy it in the secondary market or if you're one of the privileged people that can participate in a private placement, you get to give this company money and then guess what? Every quarter you get financial reporting. That's it. It's backwards looking. It's not forwards looking. There's no visibility beyond that, typically, other than press releases that come out in between those regulated reporting periods. And don't get me started on how you actually get the information, which is on CDAR for public companies, which is uh, built uh, back in, uh, I don't know, the 19, uh, early, mid to late 1990s. I mean, it looks like a GeoCity site. It's terrible. So um, maybe Richard and, and Jay, you can talk and elucidate more a bit about what's happening today and how shareholders are missing out on information and, and what we can do to improve that through security token offerings. Well, one of the things that we can do with security tokens is if I own some of the securities or shares of a company which are tokenized, I can use my private keys to vote, which means I'm signing with a private key that nobody else has, plug it in my computer, publish that to the blockchain, and then I can see that my vote actually counted towards what I was voting for. Whereas with the, the current system, the last time I received a, a package, I had to fill out some papers and, and mail it back in. And to be honest, I have no idea what happened to that package when I sent it back out. Was my vote counted? Was it changed? I have no idea what, what actually happened. So I think the transparency with regards to that and the simplicity of me being able to just vote from my home is very powerful. All right. Remember I talked about that 1978 IBM mainframe? Hmm. It did not have the capacity to record individual shareholders for each of the public companies. So what happened was the holdings were actually recorded in what we call street name. So street name is the broker who holds your account is listed as the owner of the security. So when you receive materials, whether it's proxy voting or the financial statements that a company is required to provide to the shareholders, they actually don't know who you are. They have to send it on through their transfer agent, through the CDS system, 
through to the broker who then makes sure that the uh, uh, address is correct and that you actually get the materials uh, and, and more often than not it arrives two days after the deadline for voting uh, has expired. Can, can you elaborate on some of the costs the, for the issuers to go through that process? Well think about a large public company the materials, the proxy materials that they're sending out are like this. It's paper. It's wasteful. It's enormously expensive to operate. And we have the capability of replacing that uh, with blockchain technology. Right, right. And uh, Richard, you actually kind of uh, uh, segue nicely into problem number three. Companies are operating in the dark when it comes to shareholder relationships. So if there's anyone here who's an IRO or a CEO of a company, I mean, you have um, a very valuable connection to your investors that you need to maintain. Uh, requires trust, requires regular communication, requires you to understand who that particular shareholder is. And also if you want to get new shareholders, how do you understand um, you know, how you're going to get new shareholders and how you're going to learn about them and how to get them based on who's currently invested in your company. This is all important stuff. But as Richard mentioned and Jay alluded to, very opaque infrastructure right now. You actually have no insight. You certainly don't have it in real time. Nope. You do not have it in real time. And uh, the proxy voting and solicitation process is uh, its a pain in the ass, to put it lightly. So um, maybe I'll let you guys, we'll just jump into rate some of your ideas and thoughts about with STOs, how we can improve, in reality, the, the, the way we interact with our shareholders and some of the benefits that's going to create. Well, think about it. If you're the investor relations officer at a big company, CEO asks you, who are my institutional shareholders? And the quick answer is, you don't know. You have to go do some research to find out because many of the institutional shareholders will have their own reporting obligations to their beneficial holders, uh, whether it's a public institution or a pension fund or so on. So you'll look at their last set of filings and you'll see, okay, they own X percent or X number of shares and here's how they valued them. But it is a massive effort. It's looking in the rearview mirror. It's not real time. It may not be accurate. And in particular, you can't tell if somebody is accumulating a position with a view to an activist uh, uh, position in the company or a potential acquisition. Again, CEOs who don't understand the, uh, the framework that we have in place now are incredibly frustrated with how opaque the, uh, in, the intelligence that they have. You want to look at your peers and understand, okay, where are their shareholders? Who are their shareholders? Are there places that we could be marketing our company to shareholders better? There is a ton of information that's locked up currently that you can't have access to it makes your investor relations and your corporate communications efforts much, much more inefficient. Just by just show of hands so I can understand the, the audience, how many of you guys are executives at a firm or own your own business? Okay, quite a few. Okay, great. So, I mean, obviously you would want to be able to have an open dialogue with your investors. And if you can't have that open dialogue or communication and you are a public company, then you are going to have less, you know, uh, control or influence of a positive you know share price because if you're pissing off your shareholders because you don't understand what they want what they're looking for in terms of transparency information it's not good with the blockchain and by doing a security token offering you now have access to these clients to get these feedback surveys or votes or whatever the case may be in order to make wise decisions for your business yeah, that's a good point, especially in situations where maybe there's some damage control or you need to access your shareholders quickly to deliver a message. This platform can really, really help, okay? Okay, so problem number four, folks. Managing entitlements is slow, it's expensive, and it's prone to error. Richard, what is an entitlement today, and how do we deliver these entitlements to shareholders? Uh, the, the two big ones that you see in the uh, public markets now are dividends and royalty payments. Companies that are paying dividends right now have to pay the dividend to the transfer agent who then sends the payment to the clearing and settlement organization. Uh-oh, what do we got? Oh, that says five here. Yeah, here. Our monitor is working. Yeah, okay. Well, there you go. You're at four. <laughs> but I got five here. Yeah, yeah. It's All right. <laughs> okay, we, we can do this. I have some, some recollection of what's on that slide. Uh, in any event, yeah. the company pays 
their transfer agent. The transfer agent pays the clearing and settlement organization. The clearing and settlement organization then sends that money to the dealer, and the dealer has to allocate that money to the individual client accounts. At every step of the way, somebody's taking a slice in terms of a fee, and there's a potential for a mistake to happen. And when those mistakes happen, you need experienced, expensive, smart people to fix the problem. What that means is there is a powerful disincentive for companies to pay dividends. And they're only going to do so maybe semi-annually or annually, as opposed to more attractive uh, royalty products that might in fact have a monthly revenue stream. But the fact of the matter is the costs and the risks associated with that process are prohibitive. And so one of the things that I learned uh, a couple months back is sometimes it's not just you know depository going, uh, dealing with the broker and then that broker going to the client. Sometimes the broker is dealing with the broker who's dealing with the broker <laughs> before it even gets to the client. And I actually left out the custodian too. <laughs> so there are six mouths to feed uh, be before between the company and the recipient of that dividend. So with the with the STO with your shares or your your, these being on the blockchain, we can have an address as to where or who the shareholders are. And through the blockchain, we can actually automate the payments to those individuals. And so this might be a little bit further down the line, not just with the STOs, but as time goes by and currency goes onto the blockchain, which is, we're all believers that you know, most assets, 80% of assets will eventually live on the blockchain. This is going to be very powerful. And this is the first stage of adoption. The first stage of adoption is really the companies, you know, moving forward, making their businesses more efficient, having less cost so they can have a, a bigger, uh, better bottom line. Okay, guys, I'm going to throw you a quick curveball here. I'm actually going to jump to problem number six. We'll come back to problem number five because I feel like we're flowing beautifully here into problem number six. Um, but I need to, we're going to introduce a prop here, folks, and I swear to God, organizers, don't kill me. We're going to make a really good point here with this. Just trust me. You're going to believe in it in a sec. Okay, so, so guys, <laughs> you see some nice patches of concrete over there. I'm going to need you to, uh, when, it, when you get the order, you twist it, shoot it on the concrete. Sorry, what do I do? Um, we're having a party. Which okay, way we're having do I a paper party. <laughs> so the, the problem here is we've got a huge amount of paper, okay? That, uh, that we're dealing with that's passing around from organization to organization is very costly. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all this paper, mm -hmm. okay? And we're going to do something very nice with it. So just remember that, you know, paper creates, um, paper creates some problems, right? Because, you know, who cleans this stuff up? So guys, on my cue here, let's let's shoot this off and then we're gonna have a little paper party. You guys shoot over there, I'll shoot over here, and, and everyone, we're, we're trying to get your attention here, okay? So. <laughs> you gotta turn it in the arrow there. Right. Hey! Over there, guys. Uh-oh. Not on the... This is for you, paper. There we go. Hey. <laughs> All right, off with the paper. No, you get a clock, come on, let's do it. <laughs> Woo! All right. Again, organizers, I, I seriously, I'm so sorry that we just did that and created all that mess. But the point we're trying to make here is that you got someone has to clean this paper up. It can't just be out there making a mess, right? We got to we got to get rid of this paper. We got to get rid of this destroyed. paper, guys. And we couldn't make a fire. We wanted to burn it, but we yeah. thought it would be dangerous. <laughs> yeah. So again, our apologies, but today in our world, paper is generated by transfer agents. It's generated by custodians and clearing agencies, investment dealers, us, the stock exchange. Mailings. We talk about those big mailings. So again, I think if we can do something here, and there's actually maybe even a bit of an environmental tilt here, STOs can end this madness, this paper madness that we've 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 fallen into. You got anything to add to that, or how can we top that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was exciting. I'm like pumped now. All right, we're gonna go back to problem five, and we did time that for the 30 minute mark so that people would start paying attention. Um, <laughs> In its current incarnation, secondary markets are susceptible to abuse. So as you can imagine, as a stock exchange, this is like one of our biggest worries every day is what are the bad guys doing on the market? And uh, we feel that STOs will actually help in a lot of respects in mitigating some of these risks that we're seeing from the trading and secondary market side. But I'll let uh, Richard and then Jay talk more about this because this is, this is their wheelhouse. Every CEO believes that their stock is undervalued. 
I have never met a CEO who says, yes, our, our stock price uh, fully values the, uh, uh, our business. And this corollary to that is every CEO believes that their company is being subjected to a short seller's attack um, and that there are people out there who are trying to drive down the price of the security. And the simple fact of the matter is because of the lack of transparency we talked about, nobody knows. Well, we, the stock exchange, know, but nobody else knows. Right. And so the, go ahead, Jay. So the cool thing is, you know, this this naked shorts that that he's talking about is basically when, you know, somebody is selling your shares to drive the price down, even though they don't even have the shares. And the the idea of a a, a short sell is supposed to be I'm going to borrow the shares from James and then sell them to Richard. But what's we didn't have a prop for that one, sorry. Well, what's happening is it's, it's a, a naked short, okay? So can you show them what a naked short I looks like? I cannot get naked on stage. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> we'll not do that demonstration today. Okay. <laughs> Thank goodness. So, so <laughs> the cool thing with the blockchain is now we have uh, a transparent ledger. And in order to share and transfer these tokens, you actually have to have them or you actually have to borrow them. And borrowing them and transferring them from one person to another or one institution to another is not a big deal. It can happen in seconds or minutes, unlike the process of transferring shares right now. So maybe that's, maybe that's one of the reasons why this butt naked short came in the first place. The yeah, point. no, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge issue because, uh, as you mentioned, um, the, the blockchain can solve that. Look, at, look back to your, your demonstration. Nothing happens until everybody has agreed that I've got that 50 euros after, from you who minted it. Uh, in the case of uh, we move to near real time or real time settlement, that means that the seller always has to have that token in hand when they provide it to the uh, purchaser. So again, no more naked shorting. It, it increases the transparency and reduces the potential for abusive trading practices. Right, and, and it's some other benefits, obviously, uh, with the STO, uh, you can identify activists, take over bids more easily. Um, that's, that's useful in some cases and uh, yeah, put an end to failed trades. We won't talk much about that. I think we've uh, nailed that point pretty well. Okay, now we're back on track here. Problem number seven. So we actually do have sympathy for regulators. Regulators are having a really, really, really hard time keeping up with the current securities market infrastructure. Um, they're not catching all the bad guys. They're not seeing everything that occurs and they're certainly not uh, reaching, uh, observing the market in real time. So. Uh, maybe, I don't know who wants to kick off this problem, how it's happening today, maybe Richard, because oh, he talks to regulators you. every day. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, maybe you can uh, exemplify some of the problems they're having in today's infrastructure. Well, again, this is another example of, of trading problems that occur as a result of the lack of transparency from the present situation. So for example, insider trading can be a very laborious process to identify and to police for the exchange and for the regulators that we work with. Right. There are also a lot of shares out in the market that have restrictions on them. So for example, people that raise money uh, through the public markets may have a hold period on those shares. Well, how do you make sure that that hold period is in fact respected and, and properly managed? Well, with a tokenized security, in fact, that hold period can be engineered into the smart contract that represents the token. Right. And prevent the exchange of that, uh, uh, that token until the, uh, uh, the limitation on sale has been uh, restricted. We also have companies in Canada uh, that are subject to foreign ownership restrictions, but they are in the public market. Yep. Those are also very difficult to enforce given the lack of transparency as to who the sh ultimate shareholder is in, uh, in, in real time. So again, we have an opportunity to dramatically streamline the regulatory process to prevent um, bad behavior by certain actors in the marketplace. Right. So we have a very proactive approach with the blockchain. So for instance, what we do is if you're an insider or somebody's an insider, we take their tokens and we tag that address. Okay, so everybody can see that this is an insider's address. And when they move those tokens onto the market to be able to trade, everybody knows together that, hey, this person's about to sell their shares. So if they didn't 
disclose that to the marketplace. They didn't give adequate disclosure to say, hey, you know, I'm moving this for this purpose or I'm going to sell some of my shares. Then at least all of us can be protected at the same time and say, hey, if this guy is dumping their shares, I'm going to sell two along with them rather than finding out three or six months down the line. So for the regulators, it's great because they have a proactive approach, but also for all of us, our, us investors, we right. want to be protected as well. So today, reactive, tomorrow, proactive regulation, and that works to everyone's benefit. Okay, another key stakeholder in this whole ecosystem, again, you guys have mentioned them, dealers are integral stakeholders and bear a very heavy compliance load too. So the guys that, uh, that are the gateway for a lot of investors into the public markets are the dealers, the IROC regulated dealers. Um, maybe again, Richard, what is their biggest beef today and how can we serve up some nice solutions for these guys with STOs? Well, I'm going to go all the way back to those big, beautiful IBM mainframes of 1970. IBM's here, by the way. I know. <laughs> they, they, those, they, they were awesome mainframes. <laughs> Uh, and they built a fantastic <laughs> business uh, on, the, on, the, on the back of those mainframes. Um, the uh, clearing and settlement process back in those days took five days after the trade date. So you as public investors wouldn't see your money or you wouldn't see the shares in your account until five days after the trade date had uh, actually taken place. And the industry actually has to fund all sorts of mechanisms to ensure that either the money or the shares show up in your account on the, we're now to, down to two days, which took a Herculean effort on the part of the industry to compress those cycles. But there are principally two areas that the uh, industry focuses on to secure um, the, uh, these transactions. The first one is dealers have to provide capital against each and every trade, although they are netted out, to ensure that uh, those trades, in fact, do settle. Either the cash is, well, cash is there in order to either buy shares to make up for a failure, or cash is there to deliver to the seller of the uh, security. The clearinghouse also provides something called a central counterparty guarantee. And what that does is they have recourse financing lined up in case a dealer fails and several million dollars have to be put into the system overnight in order to make good the uh, trades that uh, this particular dealer was responsible for. Both posting of capital and arranging for those standby financial instruments cost the industry a massive amount of money, both in terms of dead capital and outright costs to fund those uh, financial instruments. That winds up being paid by each and every one of us. We, we, we bear the brunt of that inefficiency because those costs are passed along to us in the form of commissions and fees that are charged to us by the financial intermediaries. That's right. Anything you want to add to that, Jay? No, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, is, what he said is exactly correct. Um, I, I would like to have just an understanding, like how much, how much money are these brokers actually posting? You know, to, billions to, of dollars on a daily basis. So billions of dollars is posted up to make sure that you know trades can be settled. Okay. However, the problem, the the big problem, why so much money has to be posted is because we're dealing in delayed time, right? Correct. It, but if it's we're collateral. dealing closer to T plus zero or real time, then that's going to be significantly reduced. And if the broker's costs are reduced, then they can reduce the cost to the customer, whether it's financing, whether it's trading, the cost is reduced to the issuer, the cost is reduced all around the board. So at the end of the day, we always want to move to a more efficient mechanism and the blockchain is that. And to be clear, if you clear in real or near real time, when you buy a security, you get the security in your account. It's not a delay and doesn't have that, uh, that, that drag that you guys have mentioned. So that would be a really uh, exciting offering. And I didn't hear anyone cheer when we said commissions and fees. So I'm assuming there's no brokers in the room uh, listening to this. Uh, again, problem number nine. So this is actually more of a, this is sort of a dealer issue too, okay? But it also impacts you as an investor because I don't know who here has recently opened an investment account. It's brutal, it's a lot of paper. Um, you know, you get something the size of the uh, encyclopedia that you gotta sign off on and not everyone tells the honest truth in that documentation either. So that doesn't help anyone. So that's, that's an issue, doing suitability and KYC protocol, applying those principles, which lead to us having a trustworthy market. So perhaps uh, you guys just talk about today's problems and that really quickly, and then some of the ways that we can work with STOs 
to, to level the playing field and make it easier for people to, to open accounts and for dealers to verify uh, information provided by uh, clients. Uh, so, I mean, one of the things that we've moved towards is a central KYC process. So, for example, in, in, in Jamaica, all the brokers are using a centralized KYC provider where the clients can go in, upload their ID, upload all their documents, and then you have this one party that's verifying everything. Because this is the reason why this is important is because the client can now manage their own data, uh, which takes a lot of time. Uh, because most people have more than one account. Just by show of hands, how many people have at least two accounts, right? Everybody opens up multiple accounts. And how annoying is it to have to go to one account, provide all your information. When you want to open up a new account, you got to pull out all that paperwork again and again for every account that you open. So the centralized uh, process can become very powerful. And what we can add to that with the blockchain is every time a new dealer takes on your information, okay? So for example, you want to open up an account with TD, okay? And TD has accepted your account. That could be written to the blockchain. And so when you go to the next uh, dealer to, to open up an account, we know that one uh, another dealer has already verified the information, so it's built up more trust, okay? So now we accept you, now we've got two verifications, or two confirmations on the blockchain. And this can become very powerful, reduce everybody's costs, and just make everything more efficient. Awesome, awesome and One of the other issues that uh, dealers have in uh, managing their know your client uh, requirements is there are a lot of investment products that are only available to so-called accredited investors. That's right. People whose annual income exceeds certain levels, whose uh, investment portfolio exceeds certain levels. And once you've done that, you're able to participate in a number of uh, private company deals, early stage deals that uh, uh, the regulators have deemed perhaps too risky for the everyday uh, retail investor to, uh, to put into their portfolios. Now there's a tremendous concern from the regulatory side that the information that people are providing is inaccurate or that the dealers are not doing an appropriate job in terms of identifying whether or not the client is an appropriate accredited investor. All of these processes can be embedded uh, into the information that you supply to the dealer the first time, can be verified and uh, streamlines that process not only for the client but for the folks that are providing regulatory oversight as well. And then yeah. the, just the last point on that, as, as Richard said, in terms of certain uh, products or securities are supposed to only be with certain kinds of investors, like an accredited investor. So what we can do on the blockchain is we can, for example, mark off James that he's a accredited investor. So we uh, tag his address like that. And so when we transfer those tokens to him, it will, it will be successful. But if we transferred it to somebody who is not tagged as a accredited investor, that transaction would actually fail. So again, we automate the process to even prevent. We go with the more of a preventative me measure rather than reactive. The reactionary, okay. Awesome, okay, problem number 10. We actually, we, we, were, we wanted to have 10, and I think this is the most macro issue that we're trying to uh, work with here, which is generational fragmentation threatens to destroy the industry. That's right, folks. The end of the world is, may, may be coming if we don't fix stuff, but we can fix stuff with STOs. Uh, Richard, from your vantage point, Jay, from your vantage point, where, where is this generational fragmentation? How do you define it? And how are we going to uh, bring all these people back together in the capital markets with the trust protocol to create the next era of securities markets? Is this where I'm supposed to cough and sneeze? Or is that the next one? I don't know. That's the next one. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. Was, yeah. Basically, if you, if you look back four or five years ago when you saw the first of the, uh, uh, the cryptocurrencies and uh, the so-called exchanges that uh, provided uh, trading services uh, for those instruments, they were specifically trying to cut out the traditional securities industry. That's right. I also heard numerous other industries that uh, people using blockchain technologies were looking to completely disintermediate all of the existing players. The mortgage markets, the lending markets, uh, virtually any financial services that uh, currently have an intermediary in place, people were talking about using a distributed ledger technologies to be able to provide person-to-person -person, uh, services instead and cut out the intermediary. Well, guess what? You know. These big financial institutions are going to fight back. They're not going to be 
disintermediated. They've seen what happened to the taxi industry, with the hotel industry, with the Airbnbs and the Ubers and so on. And they're going to be looking to implement these technologies to remove some of the rough spots that we've been talking about here today. Mm. And again, there is a fabulous uh, regulatory infrastructure, security, trust, brand identification that's been built up over generations that can in fact be used to continue to improve uh, the uh, delivery of financial services uh, using these uh, kinds of capabilities. That's right. So just in, again, in terms of that, you know, that disconnect between the different generations where you got the millennials where like, hey, you know what, what is up with this big stupid process with all of these intermediaries in between who are just basically taking money out of my wallet? And so their mindset was just, let's, let's just cut everybody out with technology. But I mean, look, I'm pretty young, but I'm not that comfortable just having robots control everything. We have to have a balance, right? We want to use technology to make humans more efficient. We don't want to just cut the humans out of the, out of the whole thing and, and work with robots. Yeah. yeah, and basically, the blockchain bros kind of hate us. Uh, they hate me more than they hate Jay, because uh, Jay's clearly far cooler than I am. But we really are looking to integrate these technologies into processes that actually are quite robust, have stood the test of time, and have substantial uh, customer loyalty at this point. Right. Okay, and this it, it is a big point. And um, I, I think what we need to do at the last 10 minutes of this presentation, we'll bring it back into what we're doing individually as companies, uh, the solutions that we're trying to deploy over the next few years and our vision for a future of practically launching security tokens in the ecosystem. Um, and Richard, this is this, actually for both you guys, because you're both in the space, but why are the exchanges the center of this universe? Why do they play the critical role of deploying security tokens? And let's- Quadriga, yeah. yes, uh, is the, uh, I mean, that's obviously an unfortunate example of what happens in an unregulated environment. You know, those sorts of behaviors, and of course, we're not entirely sure yet what behaviors were in place, <laughs> other than a substantial amount of money has, uh, has gone missing. Um, the present infrastructure is the result of a lot of time, effort, financial investment, um, in the case of the Canadian Securities Exchange, entrepreneurial spirit, uh, to deliver a trusted and robust system for capital raising and secondary market trading services. So we can take what we've got, apply the new technologies to, as I mentioned before, smooth out some of the specific areas of cost and risk that remain in the system, and actually provide a better product to all of our constituents. That's, that's well said, and um, I think, I'll just jump into the next slide if you don't mind. Uh, well, or do you wanna? Yeah, we can yeah. just add, just to add to that, I mean, like with regards to the, the blockchain bros, as he calls them, um, <laughs> you know, we, we have, this idea that the blockchain can disintermediate. But at the end of the day, what happens when everybody wants to trade their assets? Whether, let's say, for example, their Bitcoin. They end up sending it to a centralized crypto exchange, okay? And when they send it to these centralized crypto exchanges, there's no investor protection, there's no regulation, there's no insurance on the assets, and you don't know who the, who the people are behind it, if you can trust them or not. For example, Quadriga was a very uh, unfortunate example of what's happened right here in Canada where $200 million of people's money was lost because apparently some person died with the private keys. This is why you have to have the trusted financial institutions, broker dealers, stock exchange, depository, etc. parties that we've been trusting for hundreds of years that can give us that comfort where when we want to trade our tokens, we can put it on the market, we can trade it and have that liquidity. That's the purpose of an exchange is to have that central limit order book so that everybody's liquidity, everybody's orders comes together in one place. That's right, that's right. So uh, Richard, us at the CSE and our partners that are going to present after at Fundamental Interactions, we're actually approaching this from probably the most boring aspect that you can think of. No offense uh, to anyone who loves clearing and settlement. Un unsexy. unsexy, okay. Um, clearing and settlement. So Richard, talk about why clearing and settlement is the obvious entry point for launching the security token offering solution into the equity capital markets. So the Canadian Securities Exchange, and keep in mind that word securities, mm -hmm. could list a tokenized security 
tomorrow or yesterday or today. But that actually wouldn't solve anybody's problems because where the real cost and risk and the benefits of the tokenized securities come in is in that deeply unsexy back office uh, process. So our technology partners from Fundamental Interactions will be on uh, very shortly to describe in greater detail and much greater detail than I could pretend to uh, offer up what we're proposing to do. But uh, in, a, uh, in a nutshell, uh, we, we will be deploying an Ethereum-based distributed ledger behind the securities, the Canadian securities uh, industry's uh, firewall. We'll be issuing wallets to each one of the dealers and a couple of the other intermediaries that are in the system. The security will be provided by the same uh, software, encryption, and, and hardware devices that the dealers use to protect their trading systems. So it may not be perfect, but it's the best we got. And um, we will be using that to record ownership and do all of the things that we talked about um, before. The, uh, as I say, the benefit is that uh, um, it is, we, we can also turn the hashing rate to zero so we don't have the performance issues that are associated with uh, some of the current distributed ledger technologies in a public setting. Mm -hmm. So it will be robust enough to handle the kinds of volumes that uh, we ex anticipate uh, doing. Right, and an emphasis on trying not to impact too much or at all the trading behavior of the end investor, right? At the end of the day, they still want to go on their online account, uh, put a bid or an ask in, get a trade fulfilled, and own that particular stock or security. And that's something that I think that uh, the ICO guys totally missed out on and what we think is going to be a critical path to making sure that STOs are widely accepted and utilized. Anything to add to that or do you want to go talk about Blockstation? Yes, cool. So with Blockstation, um, again, we support the stock exchanges. We're all for the stock exchange and we believe that that's where securities are supposed to live. So as a technology provider and partner to the stock exchange, for example, the Jamaica Stock Exchange, this is the setup that we have. In the center, you have the stock exchange. On either side, you have broker dealers, registered broker dealers, where the clients, whether it's the buyer or seller, has to go through. So when somebody is depositing their money, depositing their digital assets, they're depositing it with a registered financial institution. This is important and it gives a lot of comfort. And those deposits are also 100% insured if they're digital assets, okay? So uh, the either side, buyer deposits, seller deposits, those guys are all using our portal, okay? The stock exchange is also using our, our portal, our exchange engine, et cetera. And all the engine, all the trading happens in the one central limit order book. And at the end of the day, it goes down to the depository. And the depository is going to do the clearing and settlement of both the cash as well as the blockchain tokens. The other cool part is, of course, with the security token offerings, especially there's a, a lot of business owners in here. If you guys were going to do an issuance, we actually have a like a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, system where you can almost click through and fill in your information in order to create your prospectus filing. Because again, this is all about creating efficiency and, and reducing cost to make a, a lower bar to entry to go public on the stock exchange so that we can have a wider audience of investors to come to the table and be able to play. And um, one really exciting thing lately, uh, very soon uh, with the Jamaica Stock Exchange, we're actually gonna be opening up a live pilot uh, to the public so everybody can actually now deposit their money with a regulated financial institution and be able to trade Bitcoin and Ethereum. Awesome. Well, we finished actually three minutes ahead of schedule. I just want to take what time we have left to thank you, the audience. We're not allowed to do Q&A, but we'll <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for your attention today. We had a ton of fun presenting. This is the first time we've done this format. First time we've done uh, this with Jay and Richard. I think we'll have to do it again. A couple things. We did tape the session. It will be available on our website at thecse.com. Follow us on social media. Meet our team at the booth right behind you there with the big blue and uh, red banners. Love to talk to you and hear about what your plans are and your interests are in the security token world or blockchain world. Uh, Jay will be there as well to be made available to talk about Blockstation. Uh, I want to thank the organizers and the Tapscots for inviting us today to come to Blockchain Revolution Global. I think they've built a beautiful thing here. Um, and I, I applaud them for taking a sector that it kind of, you know, was buried in some people's subconscious the past 12 months 
And uh, they're, they're making and doubling down on their conviction that this is going to be a world-changing technological movement, okay? So I think I have to give them a round of applause for doing that. Give these guys a round of applause for presenting. Hopefully you're entertained and informed. And uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Toronto. <laughs>